Thank you. Well, first I'd like to tell you a little bit what uh, Shipag Energy is actually doing. And uh, here our philosophy is uh, to, to find uh, uh, basins where which the industry had forgotten about or basins which are untested. And uh, so we can move in those basins away from the big crowd. So basically we like to be early in the phase of exploration and off the beaten path. So we started this company in 2007 and our first project was in the Marcellus shale, Marcellus uh, gas shale right there. We, uh, uh, at that time the industry was in West Virginia and Southern Pennsylvania and we kind of leapfrogged the industry and bought leases in uh, Northern Pennsylvania and, and New York. And uh, of course, since we were early as we want, we got those very inexpensively. And then six months later, the industry in, in, terms, in, uh, in, in terms of Chesapeake arrived quickly and uh, the cost of the acreage went up 20 times. So, we, so uh, we felt the best thing is we have no risk in all this. We, uh, we sell the acreage for 20 times of what we had bought it. So it was a good, uh, a good uh, profit. We also got involved in various shale gas projects in Europe, particularly in France, where we were the first ones to enter, and we had a huge shale gas concession in the Rhone Valley. And I still think that shale gas concession in France is one of the best, uh, one of the best in Europe, particularly now after the Polish shale is not uh, working out that well. Uh, however, after about a year of exploration, the French government decided to declare fracking uh, illegal, and they took the concessions away from us. And there, there was one concession from us and one from Total. And they took both, both of them away. So we, uh, uh, Total did not want to sue the, the, fr the French state, but we did. And uh, so the lawsuit comes to a head, I think about in a month, where we, we sued for, for, for basically for, for claims. In Switzerland, we had the same kind of Liasic shell. There, uh, we had the same problem. We got the concessions, and about a year later, it was taken away. There we also had a legal action and we actually won in the court and now that we have the concessions back and we can uh, explore it for shell gas and tight gas. Another project we were in was in Denmark, but it was technically not successful. It was the Cambrian Alain shell, which is a, a famous shell in Scandinavia, but uh, the, the characteristics of the shell were not good enough for shell gas, so we, we dropped that. Currently, we are focusing on, on uh, conventional exploration, and one example is in Spain, where we have a concession in uh, southernmost Spain, which we are actively pursuing. But also, I think our, our biggest activity is in Latin America, where we uh, work in the Paraná Basin, which is a, which is a sort of an underexplored basin, particularly in Uruguay, where we have, uh, uh, have uh, 14,000 square kilometer under lease, it's, a, it's there we pursue an, a conventional exploration play and as a second step, unconventional. So we, ca we, we see the conventional exploration, which is easy to and feasible to, to, uh, to execute. And once we work on the conventional play, we collect the data for the unconventional play. So, uh, so we go, go from one to the other. Also the conventional plays in those areas are, uh, uh, are, are cheaper to do. The wells are more productive, it's more economic. So that's why we do that first uh, as in most basins and then uh, unconventional parts are afterwards. In, in many of these more remote areas, these unconventional plays are difficult to start, particularly also because of a lack of equipment and, uh, and the, re the remoteness. Then I also would like to make some, uh, some, just gen some general comments on a couple of the issues which we always uh, stumble over with, uh, with shale gas. One is obviously the water. The water is a very sensitive topic for the public. Most people are, the are, th are, th are of the opinion that uh, water is like air, it belongs to everybody. And uh, if you, if you um, uh, mess with it or destroy it or poison it, what have you, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, just, it's just extremely bad. But we all know that with a proper well construction, you can isolate the aquifer. I think in one of the previous talks, you have seen this slide, I have a similar one right now, where you can see that the aquifer is behind several layers of steel and cement and is fully protected. And these wells are the same construction for unconventional wells and unconventional wells. Also, the, frac the fracking operations are well below the aquifer. They're not, not near the aquifer or not close to the aquifer. 
and the percentage of water used for fracking is minimal if you compare it to, to uh, the amount of water used for households, etc. So here is a here is a slide. Here's a slide which shows uh, 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 unconventional well design, and up here, the, the blue line is the aquifer. Uh, we are fracking down here, so that there's a big distance in between. And the, the blue line here, where the aquifer is, there's several layers of uh, steel and cement which protect the aquifer. And this construction, this construction is the same for a conventional well as an un unconventional well. Now I had to explain to one French of official as example. He told me, "Well, you're going to frack down here, and then the water will go." all the way up, up to here. I said, no way, because uh, what most people who are not in, the, in our business don't realize is that there's fresh water here and there's salt water in here, and it's like a hydrostatic pressure. So none of the water from this fracks will ever, will ever move to the rocks up there. <coughs> here, this is from the Barnett Shale around, uh, around Fort Worth, and you see the aquifer is in blue up here, and these are the depths of the Barnett Shell with the different fracks. And you can moni monitor these fracks with geophones, and you can see that even the longest fracks are a long way away from the aquifer. So there's, there's, no, there's no connection. And economically, for the oil company, it's much more interesting to, to keep the frack in the shale you want to be. If the frack goes outside of the shale, uh, you, you lose the frack energy, and also you lose the economic input of, of it. Here is a, this is an older slide from 2010, but uh, it shows, and at that time, the Barnett drilling, there were about eight to 10,000 wells which have been fracked in, in the Barnett uh, shale, and you can see the water is 1.7% of the total usage of the water. The far biggest one is the muni municipal uh, water in, in this area. So this uh, shows that even thousands and thousands of wells are using an amount of water which is, which is not significant for, th for the rest of the wat water usage. The other thing I want to briefly mention is the landscape and uh, the footprint of these operations. That's another point which always is uh, you know, brought attention by the people who are against shale gas. Well, most, most of the time now we do uh, well pads with 16 horizontal wells. So there's one area and the 16 horizontal wells go, go away from it. The surface of this area to, to, to drill these wells is 0.02% of the total drainage of these wells. And the impact on the landscape is minimal, as example, compared to wind turbines. So here's this diagram of a state-of-the-art in development. This little black square in here is the area which you, use, which you use to drill 16 wells, eight in this direction, eight in the other direction. And you can see the distances. This is 6.1 kilometers, and this is 1.7 kilometers. Once you have, once you have now, once you finish drilling these wells, you shrink this black thing to a little red point, which is the area you need to, to put the facility for production. So that red point is, you know, 0.02% of this whole area. So the, 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 the imprint or the footprint on the landscape in this kind of operation is minimal. Here is a, 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 a artificial wells on the left side, which are vertical wells. And the right side, horizontal wells, in, and you see the well, the well sitting in here, and then the horizontal wells down there. Here's the drilling rig. The drilling rig only will be a matter of weeks, and it's here in comparison to one of these wind turbines, which will stand here for years and years to come. And of course, the energy generated by this is far superior than, than, than this one. Then my next point is uh, why, why is why in the United States is the shale has been so successful and so unsuccessful on, on, on not so much in other countries. We, I think some of the previous speakers mentioned already some aspects to it, but basically in the United States, these uh, shale gas and shale oil uh, uh, ventures were done by small independents. These independents are not risk averse, they accept higher risks. They, they can act quickly and, uh, and can, can change also quickly. They are different than big corporations which take a long time to decide things and move, move around much slower. The other part of it is the availability of land. The, the land does not belong to the state, but it belongs to the mineral owners, which in most cases are also the landowners. So if you're a small company, you can make a deal quick.
quickly with some landowners, you get an area which you think is good enough, you need to test your ideas or test your technology. It works, you make a profit, and then you, then you buy more land around you, basically. So uh, it's not that you're worried about the materiality like a big corporation is where it imme uh, immediately has to have a large, uh, a large concession, basically. Plus these, uh, these, these uh, small independents are also very, very uh, competitive. So this, uh, the smallness of these companies not being risk averse, being competitive together with the land ownership made it possible in the United States to move, to move so, so quickly uh, forward with shale gas. I think another point is also that, that uh, there's a win-win situation with the landowner or the miller owner because he gets a, a bonus when you, when, you, when you sign him, and then he gets a royalty. So he also makes a lot of money. It's not just you make a lot of money and the landowner makes nothing. It's they are both sides make money and it becomes a win-win situation. <coughs> Another point, of course, is the availability of, of equipment, which is with a lot of equipment occurs or is available in the United States and less so outside of the United States. Plus the state, uh, the state governments uh, <coughs> are familiar with uh, gas oil operations and the regulation exists. It's not something which is totally new to them, which also makes it easier. I think a very important point is the willingness of the government to provide affordable energy and supply security and not put uh, the, carbon, uh, the carbon footprint as the main objective. Even having not put the carbon footprint on the main object, object we saw today earlier in one of the speeches that the CO2 uh, uh, emission went down in the United States. It went down because the energy became cheaper and became cheaper than coal, basically. So even not putting this as the number one thing, it, it, it had a positive CO2 effect. And uh, one thing which we hear rarely in Europe is supply security, which of course no, right now what's happening in Ukraine, et cetera, becomes an, Im an imminent problem. In the States, this always has been a concern, and you can see on the next slide, uh, it has been a turn since, since quite a while, all these expressions <laughs> decided to, uh, to go forward in that. So what are the results in the, in the US? The results are uh, a drastic increase of reserves and production, that like liquids production for the first time now, I think in months of August, uh, surpassed Saudi Arabia and Russia. Obviously a tremendous increase in, uh, in employment opportunities, low energy prices, and that's very important uh, for the economy in general. There are lots of industries which now move to the United States to take advantage of these low energy prices like petrochemicals, uh, et cetera. For the government, it's also higher tax, tax revenues. And, uh, and for the country, it's supply and security of, of the gas. If we look at uh, Europe, you know, here we have high unemployment, high energy prices, and supply and security problems. And what should we do about it? Well, one is of course to allow shale, shale gas and shale oil, oil production is one solution focus on uh, affordability and supply security and not on, foot, uh, not on carbon footprint would be another uh, thing to, uh, to, uh, to accept. And then provide a win-win si situation with local governments and landowners by providing something like a royalty for the local governments and the landowners. So they also become a win, it's also part of this win-win situation like the United States. And of course, without saying much, the streamline of env environmental permitting is this is crucial. There are also new fracks, which seems to, uh, new frack types, which begin to evolve like fracking with propane. Also, this was an issue very dangerous because it could actually explode. But now I understand there are chemicals we can put in the propane where, this, where the danger of explosion is, uh, is, uh, is inhibited. And uh, this next slide was shown by a previous spe speaker, which shows uh, you know, the, the demand of natural gas in the United, in the United States and how this natural gas is taken up by this wedge of, uh, of shale gas and provides, you know, secure supply and uh, security. Similar figure in Europe looks like this. These are the existing gas uh, uh, sources which declined and there's a huge gap here. And I think this gap could be filled as example with, uh, with shale gas. Also, uh, I think somebody mentioned today that shale gas I mean, gas from the United States as LNG costs like maybe $9 uh, uh, per, per MCF. 
I think if you, when we did our French project, I think the economics were more like six dollars per MCF you could, you could do the, the, the shale gas with within, within the country. So you have an advantage of doing shale gas within the country versus bringing in uh, LNG. So uh, let me use my last slide. The opposition always is against fracking and uh, has all sorts of stories against it, but in the United States we have 200,000 fracks per year and there's no major environmental health problem. Also, um, some of these environmentalists take fracking as a kind of hijack fracking to, uh, to argue that there should be no exploration, no hydrocarbon exploration and production at all, which of course is impossible, but we should really realize that natural gas is a transition energy from coal and maybe oil to something which comes in the future. Many of these people are also concerned that a dramatic increase in oil and gas reserves extends the life of these reserves and decreases the incentive to find alternative energy sources. And I think the answer to that is the Stone Age did not end because of lack of stones, but we eventually found something smarter to do. Uh, thank you.